This is Catonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello, this is Breach Burke. Before we get into this week's podcast, I would like to thank my patrons personally. Gwyn K, Politi, Jan H, Tanya T, Veronica S, Gabby, Helen M, Ruth S, Sunny H, Scott K, J.R.M., Susie G, Eldritch Priest, B. Lupita, C. Roberts, Jeanette, D.S., Jake B., C.D.V., Allie, Thaddeus G., V! Exclamation point v and Mary Beth R. I really appreciate those of you who have joined recently and who have stuck with me over these years. Our community is small, and there is so much I would like to do in terms of providing courses, conversation on the dark feminine, and extra content, so please consider joining at patreon.com slash Catonia. Now on to the podcast. Catonia is now an affiliate of the Divine Feminine app. Whether you download the app on your phone or subscribe via the website, the Divine Feminine app is a great resource to find sacred circles and events related to the Divine Feminine, as well as books, blogs, and other resources for those interested in pagan practice or in the myth and psychology surrounding the subject. Click on the link in the description on Spreaker or YouTube for this podcast to find out more information and to register for free. Hello and welcome to Catonia, the podcast that deals with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke. This week, we are going to be talking about the subject of fate, particularly the idea of three fates, which we see in different cultures. We're going to look at it particularly in Greek mythology, but we're also going to take a look at the uh, Norse fate figures known as the Norns. And we may discuss some other... Um, other ideas of fate that we see connected to other cultures, but we're really going to say it center mainly around the Greek ones. Not only the Mori, which is the the name that they have for the fates uh, in ancient Greece, and there are three women who we will will discuss, but also uh, the Ker or Keris, which are the bringers of doom. They're <laughs> they're like the negative fates, if you will. So we're going to talk about them, but I want to talk about the idea of of fate in general, or a little more generally and what that tends to mean, and how the the idea of fate was conceived as as a type of being, okay, in, in these different cultures. The idea for this particular podcast, well, actually, the, the I, I was going back to my podcast master list, because I spent the first part of 2024 mainly looking at female Christian mystics. I mean, I have looked at some other figures as well. I did talk about dark love goddesses around Valentine's Day. I did talk about uh, the goddess Breach around the time of Breach's Day or in bulk, uh, which is around February the 2nd. So I had to go back and think about what who I was planning on doing next. And just about a week or 10 days before I was going to do that, I got an email from somebody who had a question about the fates. And they were it's a subject that was of interest to them in particular. And I thought, oh, I should really do a podcast on the fates when I when I answered this this message. And then when I looked at my list, I said, oh, apparently I did plan to do a podcast on this subject. So so here it is. Now, the way I would like to structure this particular podcast, because the idea of fate is is huge. There's fate from a philosophical perspective, and then there's this idea of fate from a, I guess you could say, a spiritual perspective. Um, and, and the what and the way that that has translated in different cultures uh, in in terms of especially in terms of this idea of three women. So that is where I really want to start, and I want to get into ideas about fate and what fate meant. And we're going to start with ancient Greece uh, and Greek philosophy because that does seem to be one of the most logical places to start. We do have to understand too that. Fate as is it as a as a character, okay? Fate as something that's either worshipped or prayed to, or um, placated in some fashion, or appealed to. People who go to oracles to learn what you know the what the dictates of fate are. Uh, all of this is is connected to beings that are considered to be what we're going to call demonic, okay? And daemonic spirits are intermediary spirits. We now use the word daemon to mean demon, uh, but that isn't really the sense. Demon has a inflection to it that's, that implies something negative or something hellish, as in something something demonic, quite literally, right? 
But as I've said in many podcasts, people who regularly listen, this is a, re- a repeat for you. But if you're new to Catonia, uh, a daemon is an intermediary spirit. That is the original sense of the Greek word. And you could have an agathodaemon or you could have a kakodaemon. And an agathodaemon, of course, is a, is a good spirit, one that is beneficial to you. And a kakodaemon is one that is, kako is really the word for evil. It's something that is uh, malignant in nature to you. But daemonic spirits are not by nature, they're, they're not necessarily, they're not good or evil necessarily by nature. I mean, some of them may be more beneficial, some of them may uh, be more malefic. Fate is considered to really be neither. I mean, fate could be one or the other. I mean, you could, you know, again, depending on what your fate is, you could say fate has been cruel or fate has been kind. And daemons as intermediaries, when we think of, of demons as being a type of intermediary, because in a way they are, they may be more uh, elementally associated and trickier in the way that they behave. And we tend to think of demons in, in modern parlance as being pure evil, but demons re- in reality are, are somewhere between malicious and, and neutral. They're, they're, just, they're just somewhere in, you know, in terms of how they, how they behave or what their attributes are. Uh, and and in the other type of intermediary type of spirit that we're used to are angels, okay? Because angels are another type of demonic spirit. They are they are intermediaries, and uh, the idea of the demonic spirit we we really hear about a lot about it in in Plato in particular or in Greek philosophy, uh, although probably that's not the exclusive place where that idea comes from. Uh, Socrates, for example, talks about having a daemon who gives him his wisdom, his philosophical wisdom. He feels comes from a daemon. And as we know, daemons are spirits that can represent natural forces, elemental forces in a way. They can also represent psychological forces. So for instance, I did a podcast on Mania, okay, who is considered to be a daemon. And I think they they were, because they are intermediaries, they're basically assistants or helpmates or tools, I guess, you know, to to use maybe a a less, a more detached term. Of, of the divine, of whatever, whatever the gods want. The gods would send the daemons to, to do certain tasks, whether it be bringing a message to somebody, you know, it could be warning somebody, it could be trying to say, hey, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, a daemon also can be a, a force that, uh, brings, that brings something bad, uh, in, in the sense that if somebody is inflicted by madness, for example, uh, that would be a, a daemon usually sent by the goddess Hera. To, uh, to inflict madness. We see stories about that with Heracles, and uh, you know, he's, the, he's the most notable example I have in my mind, but Dionysus being afflicted by madness. Um, all of these are afflictions that come from a daemon that is being sent by a god. Uh, so that is, that is the way that we see these kind of intermediaries working. I'm going to throw in here, and I don't want to diverge too far afield on this by defining this, but even Satan is considered to be an intermediary. Initially in the Bible, the, the angel that, that acted as Satan... And Satan was not a particular being. Satan was a, a role, uh, was acting as the intermediary who blocked one's path. Okay, so that's that's what the what what Satan does in the book of Numbers. Balaam, I think his name was Balaam and his donkey, and he's a a sorcerer or a magician who's being sent by. Um, I want to say it was the Ammonite king. I I, I could be wrong about that because uh, I don't have it right in front of me. But he's sent to curse the Israelites, and the, the Satan stands in his way with the, with the flaming sword. The donkey can see it, but the, the man can't. And so he keeps beating his donkey until finally they give the, the donkey gains a voice and says, why do you keep beating me? And then finally he's able to see the angel you know, with the flaming sword saying to him, no, you're not going to go curse the Israelites. Go back and, and do this and do, you know, do, you know, bless them instead or, or, or bring this message back to the king or something. But, th- but in that case... The Satan is acting as an intermediary, saying, don't do this, do this instead. Okay. So want to understand all this terminology and how it fits together. Um, I'm, I'm very big on people understanding the meanings of words and not just simply what a lot of their modern associations are. Because sometimes I, I run into this a lot with people when you talk about influences that are either satanic or demonic in this particular sense, people automatically think, oh, well, you're, you're talking about something evil and I, I don't, I don't deal with that. And it's like, well... No, that's not that's not the sense of it. Oftentimes, these figures were used to they, they they serve a purpose. They're not they're not just that we have this idea of the rebel angels uh, that that are in it is in um it's, it's been really codified by like John Milton's Paradise Lost, truthfully, or Dante's Inferno, uh, but not was not really a a biblical thing per se. 
uh, the fall of Lucifer is not not what that appears to be. Um, it really is more metaphorical of uh, being at war with with the king of Babylon. <laughs> is really more what that had to do with um, when they talk about the the um, the morning star that falls. So anyway, again, I don't want to digress too much into that, but just to give you some background on the terminology. So now if we get to the idea of fate, okay, one of the biggest things that was discussed in Greek philosophy, and it appears a lot in Greek drama in particular, is the idea of, we, we call it free will versus determinism, okay? Um, Rush has a song about it, right? That's their song called Free Will. There's this idea of, of how free are you as a human being, and humanistic arguments around rationality around the human ability to have consciousness and to reason are connected to ideas of how much you know how much control you have so in other words your rationality because you have a conscious awareness because you can see patterns because you can determine causal patterns because you can make predictions about things and this is more in a scientific sense because when you use reason you're you're using logic and things to try to suss out what the um meaning is of something, to, under, to interpret an event or to determine what it means using reason, uh, as opposed to something that's more unpredictable where we might just say, oh, it's the will of God or, or, or something, which, which really is more akin to the idea of fate. When you go visit the Oracle at Delphi, for instance, with, which is what a lot of the ancient Greeks did, they would go to Apollo's Oracle, and what the information that they would get from that Oracle would tell them you know, this this was something that was being told by an intermediary. Okay, the Pythia, who is there, is 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 the human being who's also kind of acting as an intermediary, but she's getting the message from the intermediary. And the fates themselves, uh, in in some cultural conceptions, the fates would appear at the bedside of a child at the time it's born uh, to determine its lots. Uh, Plato has a section of the Republic called the Vision of Ur. And he had developed this rather elaborate uh, metempsychosis slash reincarnation model of things. And what Vision of Ur was supposed to be a man called Ur, <laughs> E-R, literally. Uh, and I, in some conceptions think that he might have, Ur might have been Zoroaster, who was the, the founder of Zoroastrian religion. Other people dispute that, but I, I, have, I have read that theory somewhere that Ur might have been influenced by Pythagoras or, or, or Zoroaster. But anyway... Ur is a, is a man who dies, and as they're getting ready to do the funeral rites and build the funeral pyre, there's a certain number of days that they wait, uh, all of a sudden he jumps up back to life and says, oh, I've been to Hades. So, of course, now he's giving his, now, now we would call that a near-death experience, right? He comes back and he says, oh, this is what I saw of the underworld. So Ur comes back, and this vision that he gives is of a place. Now, then this is where we start getting into ideas which were not original to Greek thinking about the afterlife. I always stress this to people. Because uh, I, I've read, even even scholars who are, are very well-versed in this say, oh, well, yeah, the Greeks always believed in judgment after death because Plato. And it's like, no, Plato's not, Plato's a later development. Plato, Plato comes in when we are starting to think about these ideas and trying to, trying to create this kind of structure and system uh, that may have been based on Pythagoras and some others. We can't show that that's original to Greek thought about the afterlife. In fact, the implication seems to be that it's not. But... This, at this point, when we have the vision of Ur, which is fairly late uh, in terms of it, where it's coming about, you know, we're saying 300s BCE, and you have to think the Greek archaic culture goes back hundreds, even over a thousand years before that. So what he says in this vision is that, that Ur comes back and claims that there's, there's a, like a stairway to heaven, so to speak, that the, that the souls who have been good and righteous rise up to this uh, place that's not, not with the gods, but it's a more celestial place. Uh, I don't know whether it's the equivalent of the Elysian fields or whatever it is, but the idea is that those souls get to get rewarded. They get to go live in a, in a, in a harmonious place. It's good. And those who have uh, displayed wickedness in their life are sent down to Tartarus. And at least in the Aeneid, which tries to give a conception of this, the idea is that they're tormented by the Furies. And I can't remember if he says that in the Republic or not. But nonetheless, there's the idea that those who have been bad are suffering in the depths of Tartarus, which is another word for the darkest point of the underworld, the abyss. And that the, those who, are, who haven't done that, they, they rise up. Because by this point, by the time you're getting to this kind of Platonism, you are looking at a vision of the afterlife that has now been moved to the sky. The idea is that the celestial realm, the immortal realm, is the realm of the righteous. 
and the realm of the true spirit and the, the, that aspect of humanity that is divine. Remember, a lot of these people were Orphics. And the Orphic cosmology, the Orphic thinking, said that when uh, the Dionysus, who appears as the savior figure there, when he, in, in, their, in their cosmology, Dionysus is appointed a successor of the god Zeus. But Dionysus also is, it's okay, well, he gets destroyed by the Titans. They, they, they kill him and they eat him. <laughs> There's another idea, eating the flesh of the, uh, uh, of the, of the savior figure, right? They, Zeus and Athena manage to rush in and, and save his, his heart, and they're able to resurrect him from his heart. Uh, and some people say it's I'm trying to think who else they say that there's some there's some other deities that are also attributed to maybe um, resurrecting him. I, I want to say Themis, but I could be wrong about that. But in any case, he's resurrected, and Zeus in the, to, to punish the Titans throws his thunderbolt down, reduces them all to ashes, and out of those ashes, mortals rise. So according to Plato, this is why you have this this Titanic nature, as he said. You know, we have we have the wicked nature of the Titans, but we have that divine spark of Dionysus. Uh, still, because they had they had ingested Dionysus, and this is the concept behind the Eucharist that you ingest the flesh and you gain that divine spark. Okay, what this has to do with the fates? So, therefore, because you have that divine spark, you have a bit of the divinity in you. So, yeah, you you have this chance at this afterlife that that may eventually that that it is now in the sky with the celestials. Okay, we st- everything starts moving in that direction. But it's not a case of, oh, good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. It was a case of, at some point, everybody is going to be reborn again after having a period of either being punished or being rewarded. And that is where you meet the three fates, who are known as the Morai. Now, the Morai, there are three of them, and their names are Clotho, Lachesis, and um, Atropos. And what they actually do is they spin the thread of... Of, of your of your fate so the the name fate the name morai itself means parts and in fact in uh in the roman equivalent they're called the parka or the parkai or the parsi and that's where we have the word parcel that comes from the idea of it's a portion or a part yeah so that's a part or a share or your allotted portion so the they were clotho Okay, um, and then who is, who is the one who spins the, we, the, the thread of fate? Now, the idea of thread is also common. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the Norns in Mor- the Norse mythology. And the Norns, uh, their, their name is said to mean twine or thread. Okay, so there's this idea of thread. Uh, you'll hear people who talk about astral projection, things like that. Uh, the idea that the body is that the soul is connected to the body by a silver thread. There's definitely this idea of thread in connection with the soul, the soul being tied to the body, and what the life of that person or body, or and even more, fate goes beyond just the fate of individuals. It's also the fates of the universe, of the gods, of everything else. Like the fates are something a, a very primal kind of daemons um, that that make these kinds of decisions. And in fact, it's said that even Zeus, the king of the gods, or Jupiter and the Romans, there's differences about whether or not they work with the fates, or, or whether the fates are subject, or whether they can change the ruling of fate. Some say that that Zeus could change the rulings of fate, but but that in that sense he had to act as somebody who is a, a fate himself. But we'll we'll get there. So you have Clotho, you have she's the spinner, you have Lachesis, who is the apportioner of lots. So she takes the thread that uh, is sp- uh, spun by Clotho, and she measures it. So that is how many years you have. That is the length of your life. And then Atropos, or uh, Isa, is the one who cuts it. And that's a name that means, uh, okay, Lachesis means the apportioner of lots. Okay, lots meaning your portion, your parcel. The one who, who, the one who breaks up. <laughs> if you think of a lot uh, as a piece of land, the person who decides, okay, you get this piece, you get this piece, who, who cuts the pie, so to speak. And then uh, Atropos, or Isa, which is she who cannot be turned. Okay, and that is the one who cuts it, the cord at the end of your life. And it says, there is a god of fate called um, Zeus Moiragetes. Okay, that's that's interesting. So there, there is, as I mentioned, Zeus has many different epithets. And this is another one. So yeah, they, they're said to be working in concert with Zeus, but at the same time, it's also been said that Zeus cannot change the will of fate. One example that we see of Zeus acting as a fate is when determining the the death of Hector in the Iliad. 
who is the main general, basically, of, of the Trojans, of the Trojan uh, force in, that, in the Trojan War. And when it's time for Hector to die, the, his heart, it, it's, it's actually a very ancient Egyptian conception, like we see with Anubis, the heart gets weighed. And there's a decision, so there's this, this weighing that goes on, and, it's just, and if, if, the, if the weight um, goes against him and is in, against his favor, then he's going to die. And in fact, that's what happens when Zeus takes out his scale and weighs it, and he's dismayed because he really likes Hector, and he doesn't want to, uh, to kill him, or he see him die uh, in battle in the way that he, that he does. Um, and he has a horrific death, because then he gets dragged by Achilles around the city walls on the back of a chariot because he wants to disgrace the body. But nonetheless, Zeus will not turn from the will of fate. Uh, it, it all goes into this, these, these sets of daemonic beings that, that deal with boundaries. Now, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos are all part of this vision of Ur that I'm talking about. So it is, is that all these souls that have done their punishment or reward come back, and then the fates... They, what they do is it's like, they cast, it's like they've cast lots. So it's like the fates have almost, it's almost like if they got little fortune cookies and little pieces of paper or something and they throw them around and they go, okay. And, and, they're, and they're, they seem to be of different sizes. So the people will go and they will grab something that they think has a certain size because they think, oh, that's going to give me a long life. Or, or they'll see, oh, that's the lot of a king or that's the lot of a, of a peasant or that's the lot of... And what Plato was saying, people have to be careful what lots they pick because what his, his character Ur would say. Because one of the first people in his group uh, was somebody who, or that he saw, was somebody who said, oh, I, I want to be a, a great king. So he rushes up and grabs the lot of a king, and he actually he's actually able to read what his fate is. And then he's dismayed to realize that, yes, he's going to be a great king, but his life's going to be cut short, and he's going to be, and he's going to die horribly. So he's like, oh, no, I, I you know, I should have thought, you know, so in other words, don't, don't, there's a moralistic side of it. Don't think in a greedy way, like, oh, I'll have a lot of power, or I'll have a lot of money, because you might, the fates might have uh, spun you a bad ending. So, so there's this whole thing about, about choosing your fate, and then being reborn. This cycle of like, metempsychosis, you're, you're continually reborn, much like the, the Eastern concept of reincarnation. Now, whether this ends at some point, Plato's not really clear on that. Uh, certainly in the Eastern conception, there's the idea of, uh, this is the wheel of samsara, and that one can be liberated from that wheel, that you reach a point where you are no longer born again, and you either um, are merging with the Paramatman, which is the, um, the supreme primal consciousness. In, in Buddhism, they would call that, you know, reaching uh, nirvana. Uh, although they say a state of nirvana can also be reached while you are alive. But it's the idea of being connected to supreme primal consciousness and not in this, this, this idea of birth and rebirth. Of course, this, this not, was not necessarily Plato's conception. But in any case, that's the vision of Ur. That's where we see the fates. Now, I'm going to read a little bit about the Morai, or the Mora is, is singular. Sometimes it does appear as a singular, and later it appears as a triplicity here. It says, At the birth of a man, the Morai spinned out the thread of his future life, followed his steps, and directed the consequences of his actions according to the counsel of the gods. Now, this is, by the way, coming from Theoi.com. It was, it was not an inflexible fate. Zeus, if he chose, had the power of saving even those who were already on the point of being seized by their fate. Okay, and this, this equates fate with death to a certain degree as well. The fates did not abruptly interfere in human affairs, but availed themselves of intermediate causes and determined the lots of mortals, not absolutely, but only conditionally, even man himself in his freedom was allowed to exercise a certain influence upon them. A man's fate determined at his death, the goddesses of fate became the goddesses of death. Morai uh, Thanatoi, uh, Thanatoyo. The Morai were independent at the helm of necessity. Okay, and yeah, in Orphic cosmogony, the, the Morai are children of Anake or, or necessity. In the non-Orphic myth, their parents are Zeus and Themis, and Themis is the goddess of order. So again, they, are, they serve a role in the ordering of the universe because they determine the boundaries. And as such, they're uh, uh, very much concerned with DK, the idea of justice. Because justice isn't just about moral right and wrong, it's also about what are the outer boundaries of things, what are the limits, what, what keeps us from leaving order and descending into chaos. And that's why we have laws. You, you have limitations on things so that one has the freedom to act and things have the freedom to grow. Uh, in the same way that you might prune a plant back to to make it grow bigger and better, you, there's it's this idea of this ordering principle. 
Let's see. So I didn't I didn't start at the beginning of this, so I'm just going to read the beginning part. The Morai were the three goddesses of fate who personified the inescapable destiny of man. They assigned to every person his or her fate in, or share in the scheme of things. Now, this leads us to, I was talking about this appearing in Greek drama, and one of the most prevalent places we see this is in Oedipus, the, the Oedipus uh, stories, particularly Oedipus Rex. What happens in that one, it, now again, this is a story I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, but if you're not, so Oedipus is the child of Elias and Yocasta, who are the king and queen of Thebes. And when he is born, that's when you have the fate coming in. They, they, you, they would go to the Oracle of Apollo to get the fate. They want to know the fate of their child. Nowadays, we might, that might be akin to having your astrological chart done or something like that. And nonetheless, there's a prophecy that comes in about you and what, what, what the, what the, what's going to happen in your life. But in this case, they were getting this information from the oracle. So the oracle tells the, tells the emissary who comes, um, this child is destined to kill his father and to marry his mother. And of course, this is a horrific fate. They think, oh my gosh, you know, this couldn't be any worse. So what they do is they take Oedipus and they, they pin his feet together, baby, little baby, because there is a point in Greek households, there's like, a, there's like a period of time before which the child is named, because at that time, because they didn't name him Oedipus, they determine whether or not the child is going to be accepted into the family. And a lot of this has to do with the ritual, ritual around the, um, the, the genius or genius of the family or the household gods. And if it was determined that that child was going to be uh, a bane to their family, that child might be exposed, might be left out to, to die. And that's what they were going to do with Oedipus. They pinned his feet so that he couldn't move, and they put him out, in, they had a shepherd take him out to the field. But the shepherd felt really sorry for this little baby, as one might. And so he unpins his feet, which are now swollen, and that's what Oedipus means, swollen foot. Okay, his, you know, oedipus, a, a swollen foot, and brings him to nearby Corinth, where the child is taken and raised by the king and queen of Corinth. So he is grown, he raised, he's raised in the royal household as though he is the child of the king and queen of Corinth. Uh, but as he gets older, he is at a, there's some kind of big festival or event, and people are drinking, and somebody at the festival, you know, in vino veritas, you know, in wine there is truth, says to him, oh, they're not your real parents. You know, you were, you know, they're, you know, they just adopted you. You're not your real parents. And he's just like, wait, what? Because he, as far as he knows, these are his natural parents. And when he goes to his parents and says, what's this that they're saying? They're like, oh, no, no, don't listen to him. He's drunk. But Oedipus is now a little perturbed. So he says, I'm going to go to the Oracle and find out. So he goes to the Oracle of Apollo and he's told the same thing. You're going to kill your father and marry your mother. And he's so horrified by this. He's like, okay, I'm going to leave Corinth now because I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not, you know, that's, that's a horrible thing. I, I'm not going to do it. So he's in his chariot driving along. Did he typical brash? How do you, do you get a license for a chariot? I have to wonder about that. In any case, he's at an age where he's old enough to certainly drive a chariot, but he's rather young and brash and uh, he gets, he passes another chariot on the road and there's a little, little mini chariot rage incident here. In any case, he gets out and fights with the owner of the other chariot or I'm not sure if he gets out or if they just like throw things at each other, or whatever. In any case, he ends up killing the guy who dri drives the uh, driving the other chariot. And of course, this being the time that it is, he just moves on. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't stop and, you know, say, oh, is this guy hurt or whatever? He just, just keeps going. No accident report there. And he ends up at the gates of Thebes. Now, at this point, Thebes is the. This is the idea of where the Sphinx appears. It's, the Sphinx is a kind of chimeric kind of a monster uh, who has like three different uh, body parts, and the Sphinx and Sphinx is female. That that's actually kind of important. But she's she's there. She's this very catonic kind of being, and she stands at the gate of Thebes and she asks her riddle. And if you can't solve her riddle, then she devours the person. And the riddle is, what walks on four legs, then on three, then on two? Now, Peter Redgrave has a whole interest, different interesting perspective on this riddle and what Oedipus's answer meant and what that meant for uh, humankind and rationality and split thinking in general, but I, I'm not going to diverge into that right now. That, that actually might be a separate topic. Maybe that would be a good live stream topic or something, that would, or special podcast topic. It'd be something different. But anyway... He answers, he would say a man, we would now say a human, but because we crawl on all fours, then we walk on erect on two legs, and then you might walk with a cane, that's three legs. And the Sphinx shrieks and she flies away. So the Sphinx that has been plaguing the city is now gone. 
So Oedipus is a hero. They're like, hey, you got rid of the Sphinx. And, you know, and again, there's some argument about what that means more metaphorically, but not to digress there. So he goes into the city and he, because he is a hero, he, they, they say, well, the, the, the king just died, was, was killed uh, by, by somebody on the road. And by the way, that person was Oedipus because the person he got into the chariot race fight with was, was his father, Laius. But he wouldn't have known that. He didn't know this was his father. So his father's dead. He's already fulfilled the first part of his fate. He's killed his father. And now he's given the queen as his wife. So now he's married to his mother and has uh, three, three children with her. So he's fulfilled his fate. He doesn't, he's not consciously aware that he has fulfilled his fate. But the thing, but okay, but what, and of course what ends up happening is then there's a plague that comes on the city because the murderer of Laos is in the city. And eventually Tiresias the prophet comes and, you know, he's blind, but he says to Oedipus, uh, well, you don't want me to tell you who the, the killer is, and basically says that it's him. And then, of course, he accuses Tiresias of all these terrible things. And Tiresias says, well, look, I didn't want to tell you. You wanted to know. This is what it is. And so, and his mother says, oh, that's absolutely ridiculous. And then she says, oh, no, well, we had a child, but we put him out. And he was exposed. He never even lived. And and then they, they bring the shepherd back to say, see, yes, you brought the child out. And he goes, well, actually, I kind of brought him to Corinth. And that's when it starts to unravel. So the parents go to the oracle. The oracle tells them the fate. They say, we're going to avoid this fate. So they take an action. But their action is thwarted by forces that were unknown to them or outside of their control or not anticipated. And Oedipus still ends up, weirdly, by their action, they've actually set the fate in motion. So by trying to avoid their fate, they've made it happen. It's like the story of the man who sees death riding in on a horse and then says, oh my gosh, death is coming for me. I'm going to leave town. And so he says, I'm going to this town. And he leaves. And then death turns up and somebody comes up to him and says, uh, hey, uh, you know, kind of like, what are you doing in town? And he says, and he says, oh yeah, I saw that, that person. And I don't remember what the guy's name was. Uh, it's kind of surprising. I was surprised to see him here because I, I have a meeting with him later this tomorrow, later in the day. And it happened to be in the town he was running away to. Idea being, you can't escape your fate. Once fate has made the decision, you, you can't escape it. Now, yes, the gods can sometimes intervene and do things, but sometimes there's even things that the gods can't intervene in. For instance, if you have somebody who dies and they say, no, no, we didn't want this person to die, there are cases where that person might be let out of the underworld. But typically speaking, the rules are that someone else has to take their place. This is also like ancient Babylon. We saw this in the myth of... Uh, of Inanna, when she makes her descent, the Queen of Heaven makes her descent to the underworld to her sister Arishkagal, and Arishkagal basically kills her. She's just basically a, a sack of corpse of skin, like hanging up on a on a hook in cavern of the underworld, and they have to send these two non-sexed beings to come in and rescue her. But the demons are trailing her as she leaves the underworld, and they say, "No, no, you can't, you can't just leave. Somebody else has to come and take your place if you're going to leave." And so they go through, through all the mourners, and the idea is that the mourners in that case, the people who are in sackcloth and ashes and, and wailing and weeping, those people were spared because they say, no, see, they're, they're observing the, the correct funeral rites, so you can't take them to the underworld. But then when her lover, uh, Tammuz, was seen in his royal finery and not in mourning, she was enraged that he was not mourning her death and that he was acting like everything was fine. So she said, okay, him, you can take him in my place. So he gets dragged down to the underworld for not observing the proper death rituals. Uh, it's interesting, but there's this strong connection between the Mori and um, and and obviously and death because they are they are the ones who are the deciders of when somebody is going to die. So there's there's a little bit more in this one, and then I'm going to switch over to their to their counterparts. Okay, it says they were independent at the helm of necessity, directed fate, and watched that fate assigned to every being by eternal laws might take its course without obstruction. So in other words, they were not only the ones who spun the fate, they were overseeing to make sure that it went the way it was supposed to. And Zeus, as well as the other gods and humans, had to submit to them. They assigned the Arrhenius. Okay, now we've talked about the Furies. The Furies are the assistants of the fates, who inflicted punishment for evil deeds, their proper functions, and with them they directed fate according to the laws of necessity. Typically speaking, the Arrhenius were forces of guilt, as we see in the case of Orestes, when he had to, when he was forced, really put between a rock and a hard place and ended up having to kill his own mother. The Arrhenius deal with things, and, I, and what has been noted by uh, Sarah Isles Johnston 
is that the Arrhenius tended to have to tend to tended to deal with ancestral crimes, things that happen within the family. But I have a whole podcast on that. It says also as goddesses of birth who spin the thread of life and even prophesized the fate of the newly born, uh, Alethea, who is the goddess of childbirth, was their companion. As goddesses of fate, they must necessarily have known the future, which at times they revealed, and therefore were therefore prophetic deities. Their ministers were soothsayers and oracles. Okay, yeah. So in that sense, the the Pythia is the is the intermediary. Um, as goddesses of death, they appeared with the Charis and the infernal Arrhenius. Okay, we're going to talk about the Charis in a minute. The Mori were described as ugly old women and, and sometimes lame. They were severe, inflexible, and stern, which is interesting because, because fate is not, is not considered to be inflexible, really. But, um, or at least it could be, it could be modified to some degree uh, by the immortals anyway. Clotho carries the spindle or roll, uh, the book of Ate. Okay, <laughs> now, we, now we've brought up the term Ate. Ate is the word in Greek for deception, and it is literally the entire theme of the Iliad. If any of you listen to this podcast, ever took my Trojan War class, you know we talked a lot about the theme of Ate, which looks like the word eight, but it's got two little dots over the, the final E, and it's Ate. Because literally there is a deception that goes from one end of the book to the other, and all of these deceptions end up directing the course of how things go. It's a type of, of trickery. So, in that, And that's interesting that that's, that's the book from which Clotho is, is spinning the thread of life. The, she holds the book of Ate. And so it's not, literally it's like your life is, is full of deceptions. <laughs> your life is a series of deceptions. Be, and that's interesting too because it almost implies that your reasoning in things is not reliable. That is one thing that fate shows is, what, is how you cannot rely on reason. When you think you're going to use your reason and your analysis to be prepared for something, you still can't escape your fate. In some way, you will be deceived into accepting your fate if you try to outwit it. Lachesis has a staff with which she points to the horoscope on a globe. That's interesting. Remember I said about astrology at the beginning. So this is your determination of your fate. And Atropos has a scroll, a wax tablet, a sundial, a pair of scales, or a cutting instrument. Any of those things. So a sundial, again, marks the passage of time. A pair of scales, of course, has to do to a certain degree with, with either with justice or, as we've seen in cases where your fate is weighed against some other situation, and it's determined whether or not... It's almost like in, if you play Dungeons & Dragons, it's a little like, okay, you, you roll the 20-sided die and just see how well you do. Um, it's that kind of a thing. Um, and which is also why we the rolling of dice is like the casting of lots. It's it's this fate that probably the Norns would have called, not the Norns, but the but that the Norse would have called the weird, and which has to do with a fate that is completely impersonal. It's just the the throw something in by chance, and that's that's another idea for chance. You know what what just comes up. But she also has instruments for measuring and cutting the thread of life. Now they mentioned the Roman uh, parkai were known as nona, uh, decuma, and morta. So there's this implication of sort of birth, the length of your life, and death. Now, let me talk a little bit about the Charis, and then I'm going to talk about the Norns. So the Charis were these female daemons of violent or cruel death. This includes in death by battle, by accident, murder, or ravaging disease. Another spirit, Thanatos, was the god of nonviolent death. So, yeah, Thanatos, they're connected to the god of death. Thanatos, Thanatos is the brother of Hypnos, who's the god of sleep. They're both children of Nyx, the goddess of night. So they're, the Charis are connected to violent death, whereas Thanatos is connected to nonviolent. Okay, They were agents of the Mori, the fates, birth goddesses who measured the length of a man's life when he entered the world, and they also were agents of Moros, or Doom, the daemon who drove a man towards his inevitable destruction. The Charis were cravers of blood and feasted upon it after ripping a soul free from the mortally wounded bodies and sending it on its way to Hades. Thousands of Charis haunted the battlefield, fighting among themselves like vultures over the dying. The Charis had no absolute power over the life of men, but in their hunger for blood would seek to accomplish death beyond the bounds of fate. So they were, they were, they're almost like forces that could bring you an untimely death. So the Charis were forces, of, these female forces of untimely death. Uh, the Olympian gods are often described standing by their favorites in battle, beating the clawing death spirits from them. This is why a lot of times in the Iliad, when you see all of these uh, figures and they're like, you know, Apollo stood next to him and then, you know, even Aphrodite standing next to Aeneas or all these, all these different 
deity standing on the battlefield, it seems really weird. You're like, why would they stand there? But that's what they're doing is they're opposing these these spirits of doom. Uh, Homer doesn't necessarily mention them, but uh, directly all the time. But that is that is what they're, they're doing. Uh, some of the carries were uh, personifications of epidemic diseases which haunted areas ridden by plague. And in that sense, they would be connected to gods associated with plague, like Artemis and Apollo. Yeah, in particular those two, but plagues could be sent by pretty much any of the gods. But certainly there's Iapetus, who's the titan of violent death. And then there is, yeah, and, and Apollo in particular is a god uh, who brings plague. But both he and his sister uh, Artemis will do that as well. Um, the Charis were de de depicted as fanged, taloned women dressed in bloody garments. The Charis may have been the evil spirits released from Pandora's jar to plague mankind. Hesiod mentions them indirectly in his account of the episode. He describes these spirits as kakoi, or evils, uh, nosoi, which is sicknesses and plagues, and lugra, which are banes. Yeah, and so they supposedly uh, they are the children of the Nyx with no father, or of Erebus, which is the deep, dark gloom that comes out of chaos, and, and the goddess uh, Nyx, they are said to be children. So these are all children of the night that we're talking about, uh, including the fates themselves, though again, in some versions... The fates are connected to Zeus and Themis, so they are more connected to order. These would be more; these are more disorderly spirits. So as we can see, the Charis, even though they are agents of fate, they also sometimes try to bring somebody's life uh, to an end earlier than expected. So this would be, so if you felt that somebody had an untimely death, uh, this would, the, the Charis would be responsible. And there, there's a lot, the, the, the Charis, they're, they're probably, at some point, they, they should probably have their own podcast because there's a there, there's a whole lot of associations with them and the idea of the care or or that particular spirit uh, that that does appear in the Greek myths and there's it's a lot it's a lot to go into here at least in something that's an overview I'm just going to see if there's anything quickly that I can share with you here some of the the, the quotes here from the Iliad uh, Odysseus addresses the Greek army at Troy you are all witnesses whom the charist have not carried away from us. Uh, and then there's, that's Iliad chapter two. So that's probably when Odysseus was berating them for, they, they were being tested as to whether they were going to run away or not, or just give up on the battle. So he makes his, his speech to them. Adrestos and Amphios, armored in linen, sons of both Merops of uh, Percote, who beyond all men knew the art of prophecy and tried to prevent his two sons from going into the battle where men die. Yet these would not listen for the dark Charis, uh, Thanatoi, the spirits of death were driving them onwards. So yeah, the idea of somebody running into a battle and doing something very stupid and risky. Probably nowadays we would say this would be the result, especially in younger people, of your frontal lobes not being completely developed because that doesn't happen until about age 21 or 22. And it's said in the time period before that that you're just prone to do stupid stuff <laughs> and take stupid risks. Uh, I mean, I mean that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's it's good to have that energy to say, yeah, I'm up for the challenge. But other times we just do things that are that are that are really stupid. That's why there's all these laws preventing people of a certain age from doing things. Although the cutoff seems to be 18, it should probably be older than that if they're if they're really going by that. So yeah, you'll see this um, in Homer's Iliad. Enomus the augur was the lord of the Mysians, yet his reading of birds could not keep off dark care or death. Uh, but he went down under the hands of swift running uh, Achates, really Achilles in the river as he slew the other Trojans beside him. Yeah, so Alex Alexandros or Paris, the godlike, when he saw Menelaus showing among the champions, this was in the point where he was, Paris had challenged somebody to, they, they basically they were challenging to have a, a duel to retrieve Helen rather than having a full battle. When he saw Menelaus showing among the champions, his heart was shaken with him. To avoid Kerr, death, he shrank into the host of his own companions. So he becomes cowardly, he turns and runs back into the castle when he's confronted with actually having to, because he's afraid that he's going to, he's going to die in this, and he's not, that he's, that, that Menelaus is his better in, than him than his battle. Yeah, so it's interesting, but Kerr is used as a word in, interchangeable with death here, even though we tend to think of Thanatos as death. But this is a more grisly death, like almost assumed to be an unnatural death that is coming as the result of a spirit that is bloodthirsty. And when we see these bloodthirsty feminine forces, we might think of, say, a Sekhmet or a Kali who just goes through and recklessly devours. Although probably those two deities, they certainly in the case of Sekhmet, Sekhmet would be the, the ravage of the sun god causing epidemics and, and, and plagues and droughts due to famine and, and due to the excessive heat of the sun. But here we're just still talking about this idea of these feminine figures, these feminine death figures that are bloodthirsty. And... 
Yeah, and so they are the counterparts of the of the Morai or the Fates. And sometimes they try to make someone's fate arrive, meaning their death arrive sooner. So we have all of these different concepts of death. We have care, this idea of violent death, and then we have what we see as far as, far as one's portion of fate, how much time you're allotted. You know, how how much you know how much how much life do you actually get in the sense of measurement of time? Which really also, I mean, they, they link it to um, Zeus or this this particular aspect of Zeus that has to do with fate, but there's also the Zeus Morigetes. They, they 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 link it to him. But there's also, if you want to get, you know, look at the, the Titan aspect, we're seeing links to both Saturn or Kronos and uh, Iapetus, which has to do with Kronos being the god of time. And we so he has to do with, and of course, initially, Kronos is a devourer. That's why there's a war between the Olympians and the Titans, because he is, he is a ravenous devourer of all of his children, namely because he doesn't want them to succeed him. And there's, of course, a fate or a prophecy. So there, he, even, he, even he's subject to that. And it'd be interesting to think about the relationship of Kronos and Iapetus to the face. I don't think that's ever really talked about anywhere. Hesiod might have might have some clues about it, but nonetheless, uh, the fates are some of this this titanic brood that comes out of the the initial five beings that we have at the beginning of uh, the creation you know, out of the void or out of chaos, and that is uh, Tartarus, Erebus, Nyx. Gaia and Eros. Those are the five first that come out. And all of them, most of them relate to the underworld. You know, you have Tartarus, the depths. You have Erebus, which is like the gloom of the underworld. You have Nyx, who's the goddess of night. Okay, so you have this night space. You, you almost see an, an Egyptian inflection there, the ideas between um, day and night and, and the battles of night and things like that. You have Gaia, of course, who is the earth the firmament of the earth, and then you have Eros, which is which is just the opposite. That's like the drive. That's like the, the drive to, to live or the will to live. So it's, in other words, out of this darkness, you have this, you still have, you also have this primal drive, this primal love drive that uh, that actually creates. So it's interesting. But certainly in that mix, we see uh, this is where the, the fates come out of, along with a lot of these other daemonic forces that, that populate the world. And when you have a worldview, an archaic worldview, that suggests that the world is populated by daemonic spirits of all kinds, both psychological, you know, mental, emotional, and connected to the physical. I mean, because obviously you have, uh, you have nymphs and satyrs and, and uh, centaurs and spirits that are connected with the forests and the woodlands and, and, the, and the elements and, and the waters and, and things like that. So you have all of these kinds of, of, of creatures that are that are definitely coexisting, and that you, as a as a human being in the midst of all this, are trying to coexist with. So by the, by the time you get to Greek philosophy, now you're at a period of time where people are trying to say that, and, and where you're starting to actually see the inflection in the culture of humans being like gods in a certain way, or having the divine spark because of. That that or that Orphic cosmogony that that's starting to gain prominence, particularly among the philosophers. I would say probably most of the philosophers were you know were Orphics, at least the ones who were around at that time. We're not really sure exactly when Orphism started. It probably had secret things because this had to do with the secret mystery cults, and as we know, those have to do with dealing with death or losing one's fear of death, certainly. Uh, there was a there's a, there's almost a a saving function there. It was the idea that well, if you were initiated and you knew the special passwords and things, you could, when you when you died and went to Hades, you would you would go to the places that were better, not the places that were worse. And again, it, the idea of judgment was certainly a much later thing. Initially, our only ideas of judgment are connected to this boundary setting and the order. And certainly the fates are part of this. It's a matter of, okay, this is, this is, this is where you're inevitably headed and you can't, there's the, there's the idea of what you can change and what you can't change. And a lot of times, you know, there's that whole struggle. And this is what we see in a story like Oedipus. You are struggling between rationally, I know this is going to happen, or I've been told by the Oracle that this is my fate. So I'm going, I'm going to be smart and I'm going to try to get away from it. But every time you try to get away from it, you basically, you can't get away from it. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. It's like you have to yield to whatever life, you know, has apportioned for you. So let me just quickly talk a little bit about the Norns and then I'm going to um, finish up for this. I might end up doing another another session on this, whether I do a second podcast or whether I do 
because I do my live stream Mondays. Those of you who don't know, I do a live stream Monday on Instagram at noon Eastern time. Uh, And I will also do, sometimes I do special podcasts for patrons only, but I may, this is a subject that I'm probably going to talk about more. So anything beyond what I cover in this podcast, you might want to check that out. But the Norns, okay, so let's talk about the Norns for a minute. There are three Norns. Now, the, the origins of the Norns in in Norse mythology, the, uh, the, the term itself, they're not really sure. Like I said, it has to do with two twine, is this idea of thread or, or, ma- or weaving thread. Uh, that says here, Beck Pedersen suggests that the word Norn has relation to the Swedish dialect word Norna or, Nor- or Nurna, it means to communicate secretly. So it, inter- it relates to the perception of Norns as shadowy background figures who only uh, really ever reveal their fateful secrets to people as their fates come to pass. And there's not a lot of stories about the Norns, which is why we're not doing a whole thing about the different stories. Same with the fates. They appear in different places, uh, but they're not. There's not. There are not so many stories about them per se. And here, the word fate. They, they talk about weird as being the word uh, w y r d as being the word for fate. But uh, as it's been pointed out, I was I was looking at some material from uh, Jackson Crawford, who was a University of Colorado professor of um, of Nordic studies, and he said weird has more to do with the kind with that impersonal fate. It, it's not a a being or a figure looking at you and and thinking looking kindly or giving you the stink eye. I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with how they feel about you as a person or a personality. It's just impersonal. This is just what your fate is. Okay, that's weird. Now there's three fates. Uh, the three Norns are um, Urthur. Uh, Verundi, and then there's Skuld, and those are the those are the three, and they have often been loosely translated as past, present, and future. But as he explains, uh, Jackson Crawford, uh, he says, no, that's not really quite what it is. Uh, Urthur is the one. If, if the, any of the Norns are mentioned by name specifically, it tends to be Urthur, which is which is interesting because she her name literally has to do with what has happened. Uh, he mentioned that uh, verundi is a is a cognitive of a verb. Uh, it's really kind of a um, it's a participle of uh, the the word for to happen, okay, or to become, uh, which I think is ver uh, verdi. I think that's what it is. Yeah, you can correct. I mean, I, I could be wrong about that, but but it's uh, but it's verundi, which means more or less is translated to becoming or happening. So it has to do with fate as the idea of what what you are becoming, what is happening, what you know, what you're you know, what what you're doing, what's what's happening in the course of your life. Now, Urther uh, has to do with what has happened because it's more of a past tense. I think he explained it as if sing is the present tense of something, this would be like sang, you know, with connection to this uh, this verb verdi. So it's, uh, it's Urther. So this has to do with what has happened. So the fact that he had he had noted that the fact that Urthur comes up as the one the if any of the Norns are mentioned by name it tends to be her more than the others and they are portrayed as three females then he, there's this implication almost that basically it's saying that you it, I think the way that he had explained it was that the concept of fate is that what you've done in the past is what's going to come back to you there's almost a karmic sense of it of the idea that your past is somehow tied up with your fate. So the fact that this happens, like the Norns come, and again, over the cradle of an infant at the time of birth, almost implies like a reincarnation kind of model, although I don't think that's ever explicitly stated in, in Nordic thinking, that's that, that were Nordic um, afterlife mythology. But the idea of fate is it's somehow built on your past or your past actions. Uh, now, Skuld has to do with what ought to happen. And that's interesting because it's not saying what will happen, it's what ought to happen. So this is where you see the element of free will kind of playing in here. This is what fate has laid out for you. It's based on your past actions, and how are those past actions going to come back to affect you in the present? In other words, your fate has to do with the sum total of your actions. So it's interesting. And he, that's why he said it's not really quite right to say one's past, one's present, and one's future. It's more overall about how you behave and how you know what what the consequences are of your actions. So that's the idea of the Norns. Now the Norns are said to guard Yggdrasil, the uh, the tree of the tree of life. They are, and they mention other some other deities that they are connected to. And let me see if I can get the pronunciations right on this. There's the uh, the Frulia 
which is a word, it's spelled F-Y-L-G-J-A, which is a follower or and often refers to afterbirth. So this is actually a protective guardian spirit in an animal form and that eats the afterbirth of the, you know, after the person's born. In, in theory, I mean, that's that's what this is. Now, the traits of so, so this this is an animal guardian that you have with you throughout your life, and that this uh, the traits associated with that animal will mirror the personality of the, of a person. So uh, I think I was an example I saw that if somebody is very very sly, uh, you know, and, and crafty, then their uh, their fulia is probably a fox. Just for example. Uh, if it's a very strong man, it would might be a bear. You know, it, it's so you're you're. It, it's kind of what we talk about now as being like a totem animal, right? Uh, whatever our our guardian animal is. Now it says they appear in dreams, but they and they can't change fate. But they said if you happen to see your fulia outside of a dream, like if it actually appears to you, then that's probably an omen of death, because it may be appearing because your life is coming to an end. Now there's another spirit called the Haminya. Uh, which is like a guardian angel type spirit. It's a guardian spirit that brings good fortune. It, so this this is this is like your fortuna. This is like your luck throughout your life comes from your uh, haminya. And when you die, this this particular spirit gets passed to another family member. So it's a type of a household spirit. So they they are supposedly they, they, there's a thing here that says that they are potentially. There's not always a clear distinction between the Norns, uh, the Fulias, the Haminyas, and on and the Valkyries. And the Valkyries, of course, we've talked about in another podcast. These are the ones who are the like the psychopomps. They they bring warriors in particular. They choose them from the battlefield and bring them to their death. And that's the other thing too. There's this idea of choice that it's the fates who are choosing you and choosing the moment that you're going to die. Um, now, there's a number of things in the Eddas that talk about the uh, the Norns, which I'm not going to read through all of these here, but. But fates, they were considered to be neutral. They're not necessarily considered good or evil. But if you had a negative fate, as I said, you would be. they might consider them to be an evil. And if you had a, a positive fate, then you would consider them to be beneficent and shining on you. Now, Yggdrasil is, they, they are the ones who supposedly uh, attend to this particular tree. It says they draw water from their sacred well to nourish the tree at the center of the cosmos, uh, Yggdrasil and preventing it from rotting. So they are also the ones who keep, they're not just, again, not just dealing with individuals, but are dealing with the, the continuation of life as a whole. It says they're, they're described as powerful maiden giantesses or Jotuns who arrive from Jotun, I, I think it's Jotunheimer. I, I, I know I've done this in another podcast, that ended the golden age of the gods. It says, besides the three Nords tending uh, Yggdrasil, pre-Christian Scandinavians attested to Norns who visited a newborn child to determine their future. They could be malevolent or benevolent, the former causing tragic events in the world while the latter were kind and protective. So yeah, so we it, it's interesting how we have this idea. And it is said that they, the origins of the, the Norns probably are connected, like a lot of things, it probably came to a certain degree out of the Greek and Roman the, the beliefs. That they were um, brought that brought that way, at least at least the Norns as we seem to conceive of them, or maybe as they were conceived of in the Eddas. It's possible that earlier on they served a different role, but nonetheless, it's really interesting that we have this tri- triplicity of women, perhaps re- representing our idea of time, uh, the arrow of time, as past, present, and future. Uh, although, as we see, that's not always what the implication or inflection is. And that also seem to represent the relationship between our our reason and our ability to guide our own destiny and those forces which are outside of our control. So that's all I'm going to say about it for now. I will probably be doing more on this subject, so there'll either be a part two on this subject or we will, um, I, will I will delve into it in another forum. But thank you so much for listening. If you uh, enjoy the work that I do here at Catonia, I'm trying to always improve things all the time. I still am a one-woman show. I was having this conversation with somebody the other day because I feel like there's certain things that I do that people don't see or don't get as much marketing or visibility as they should, and that's because I can only do so many things at once, uh, and right now I'm not in a position to to pay anyone to do it for me. So, so I do... Uh, I do rely a lot on patron support, so if you do want to support my work, uh, patreon.com slash Catonia. I did thank my patrons at the beginning of this episode, and of course I always thank them because a lot of what I do is is possible because of them. 
And it, it's still, it's, it's a growing community. It's probably three times the size it was last year, but it's still, more people are most certainly welcome. So if this is something that interests you, uh, definitely uh, check that out if you, if you are interested in supporting me. And of course, I have my great thanks to those who do. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, on Instagram, I am Katonia Podcast. I'm that on X as well, though I am on Instagram more often. Katonia Podcast, one word. And I do do Monday live streams, as I mentioned, usually at noon. Sometimes if something happens, I have to move the time, but I usually will post a little announcement at least a couple hours in advance of the live stream so people know. And I usually will list whatever the topic is going to be for that week. Uh, I also am on... Uh, Facebook is Katonia Podcast, two words, and I have a YouTube channel. Maybe you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if, but if you're listening to this via Spreaker and you want to subscribe via your favorite podcast app on Spreaker, uh, that is where I get, you know, those are the two, my two bases for, for this particular um, podcast. And so, but if you've not checked out the YouTube channel, I do post other things there as well, like the live stream. So if you're not on Instagram, I will on Tuesdays post the uh, Katonia live stream there. So you're getting both my podcasts and you're getting my live streams. And there may be more material in the future as well um, as I'm adding some different things. Uh, hoping to do a lot of really cool stuff in the future. I've got like five books coming out this year, mostly fiction, but may have some other work coming out, nonfiction work as well. And I'm hoping to be working on starting a kind of open university for people that is very inexpensive, uh, but will allow people to get certificates in certain subjects that are related. Uh, and it would, this would not be just me. This would be me working with others. So anyway, there's a lot going on. But remember, I am one person, so sometimes if things move a little slowly, that's why. And but I'm always also willing to work with and affiliate with other people as well, because, uh, you know, I think the more the more more people who are working on this topic, spreading the importance of discussion about the dark feminine, uh, the better. Anyway, that's my little plug. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode.